written online. So many people watch my uh, uh, preaching in online. So about uh, every every three days a week, I preach in online. So I'm very uh, uh, glad that God used me in New York City. Four different uh, four different group I preach. Uh, and uh, today evening I go to Bronx to another group. And yesterday somebody called me to come e evening to Ozone Park, but <laughs> I cannot attend there. So I got keep me always busy to preach. I'm very glad about that. And people listen. Uh, last uh, last two weeks ago, uh, w we attend in a Bengali book fair. It's a little Bengali uh, secular book fair. Many Bengali people is there, many uh, books uh, stall over there. Uh, so I, every day I attend there, we attend, my wife attend there, and distribute all my gospel tracts to the people. They gladly receive it and ask some question. They want some, where is my church? Where uh, they want to meet, uh, want to attend some church. You know, some Muslim people, they want, they ask some question, but very generally they ask some question. So, this is the uh, this is good for me and good for uh, us. The God use me and give some opportunity to preach the people. Uh, so uh, Bangladesh people are they're doing well. Uh, you know, the one one of our sister, um, she con newly converted and her, her husband tor tortured her. Now her and her husband is now in jail and court custody. Um, and uh, uh, we are praying for the sister. His, her name is Siza, uh, very beautiful lady, and I saw one child. He has one child. And uh, people are, uh, our, our country people are very bravely they're preaching to the people. But you know, the Muslim country is very difficult sometimes. So we need to uh, your prayer for our people in Bangladesh. So. Finally, I got my driving license. Uh, it is uh, good for me. Uh, and uh, I'm planning, I'm planning, I'm praying, and pray for me. So when I get my car, I always keep my some small table. And some places, what the Bengali people, some places I uh, set my table and book, books. Also, I'm planning to get some, uh, get, get a speaker. So I can love to can uh, preach to the people in Bangla, uh, Bangla people, Bengali people. So you know, so prefer everything, and all the blessing comes from God, and all, everything for, for your pr prayer. I'm very very appreciate to everybody our church that praying for me. Thank you, Pastor. It's good to see him and. He's going to be here just for the morning service today, and uh, thank you, Tim. Yes, sir. And uh, let's take our Bibles now and go to Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, we're going to read verse 26 to 31. But let's uh, go to the Lord today, and uh, please join me and and ask, ask God to bless our service in a great way and that people have a uh, complete understanding of what the Bible says, all right? Father, thank you so much for this time and thank you, Father, for Nathaniel. I pray you bless him in Dipti and, Father, give them converts of Christ. I pray, Father, you uh, would do a work in their, in their lives and in, among the Bangladeshi people. Father, you blessed him while he was in Bangladesh, and he's planted many churches there. We thank you for that. And we pray, Father, you do the same thing in this uh, in New York City. And we pray, Father, you meet his needs. I pray you provide a car for him and uh, the microphone and the speaker. I pray that you'd use him for your glory and honor. And, Father, we are asking today for your presence and your power. And Father, help us to understand this portion of Scripture. And help us, Father, do your will. We pray, Father, you open up our understanding. Help us comprehend this. And Father, we're praying for an unusual, God-blessed service. 
And Father, we ask you to do a work that only you can do. And Father, we promise to give you all the glory and honor in it. We're praying you meet my needs now as I uh, seek to preach. And we pray, Father, you'd use me for your glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So notice, if you would, uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, we're going to read from verse 26 to 31. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Thank you, Nick. And the Bible says, For we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking uh, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy on the two or three witnesses. Uh, how much sore punishment suppose ye that he through uh, he thought worthy who had trodden on the foot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know him that he had said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Again the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31 is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Thank you so much. You may be seated. So Paul's addressed this epistle to three categories of Jews. There were co the converted Jews, and they, these were Jews who had been saved by God's grace, and um, they immediately uh, were under great persecution from their family, society, ostracized uh, by their fellow Jews. And this is a problem. When cultures come to Christ, there are some cultures that the Jews looked upon the, the converts that they were dead, they died, and they're going to be buried. Now, not literally, but that's what they thought. You know, that we're not going to have them as a family member anymore. And then the second group was made of those Jews who intellectually were convinced but not converted. And Paul warns these Jews throughout the epistle about their need for conversion. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2. And we pick it up here in verse 1. And the Bible says in Hebrews 2 and, and verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which were heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So the question here is, how shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? That word neglect means to be careless. And people, uh, they, they, they love coming to our church. They're not saved. They enjoy the preaching, but they're careless. They're careless because week in and week out, they could die, they could miss the rapture, and these are things that are so important, and they're really presuming, uh, after they have the knowledge of salvation, to think they can go on without being dealt with. So uh, it's a warning. And then we see in chapter 6, and notice if you would, chapter 6 and verse 4, and the Bible says, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the, uh, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herb meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto uh, 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 cursing whose end is to be burnt. And the Bible says uh, in chapter 10, and notice if you would, verse 26, the Bible says, For if we sin willfully 
after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. It's Christ. He's the one who gave his life. He's the one who died in our place. He's the one who died for every individual that came in this world. And it's Christ that we need to receive as our Lord and Savior. And then notice chapter 12, verse 15. Sorry. Verse 15, the Bible says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble him, and thereby, thereby many be defiled. So we have verses of Scripture that Paul was dealing with these uh, Jews that are intellectually convinced but were not converted. And then third of all, we see the unconvinced Jews. They were attending the preaching but were not yet convinced of salvation through faith in Christ. And we see in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, please. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that's to say, not of this building. And then he goes on and says in verse 14 and 15, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of New Testament, that by the means of death, by the redemption of the transgression that were uh, under the first testament, they which uh, are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then he says in uh, verse 27, 28 of the same chapter, uh, for uh, as it appointed the men wants to die, but after this the judgment. And that's why it's so important for people who are lost to come to Christ today. Because in such a time you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And so we want to be ready in Bible says in verse 28. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, uh, without, uh, without sin and the salvation. So today we want to look at the warning to those who are intellectually convinced but are not converted. Notice, if you would, chapter 10 and verse 31, please. The Bible says, a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And uh, number one, the, the, there is a coming of divine judgment. And uh, you can dismiss it. You can put it off. You say, I don't believe it. That's fine, but it's coming. God is a God that cannot lie. He, he always shoots straight with his, with his uh, followers, with his unbelievers. It doesn't matter who they are, but God always shoots straight. And notice he said in verse 40, uh, 26, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. Verse 29, he said, How much more sore punishment suppose ye that uh, uh, he be thought worthy who had trodden on the Son of God, uh, the, on the foot the Son of God, and had counted the blood of his covenant, wherewith uh, he was sanctified in a holy thing. I mean, this is, this is lunacy on man's part to rebel against God, to fight against God. And he says, how much more sore punishment will, will take place those who despite unto the Spirit of grace. I'm telling you, beloved, it's, it's going to be so fearful when you, when you have to deal with a thrice holy God at the, judge, uh, the great white throne judgment and uh, act as if you've taken his grace of the gospel as a common thing. It's like, you know, I'll have a Big Mac and fries and a Diet Coke. Oh, no, I'll have Wendy's and uh, so on. It's, it's not common. You're talking about the Son of God. You're talking about, the, you know, the, the third, second person of the Godhead who came and died for our sins. It's not common. So literally we see man's rejection. Verse 28, he says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy on the two or three witnesses. So unbelief is unbelief. 
you say, well, preacher, I, I, I believe the Bible, but I, I hasn't gotten in my heart or whatever the, the thought is this. The bottom line is what God says in his word. Notice, if you would, John 19. John chapter 19. And notice, if you would, John 19, and we pick up here in verse 11. And God tells us, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it was given uh, thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greatest sin. So Jesus is speaking here to Pilate, and he's telling him, you have no power. The only reason there's, there's an, a supposedly power is because the greatest sin is Judas Iscariot, and he delivered, you, uh, delivered me to you. But it's, it comes from above. There's no power against God. You can't win. You're defeated already. The Bible says in Romans 3, uh, Romans 3 that man has no strength whatsoever against God. He's like a paralytic man. He's without strength. So, and notice you would, Acts 17, please. Acts 17. And we, we pick up here in verse... Uh, Verse um, 30. And notice God says in verse 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Why do we have to repent? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Because Jesus resurrected from the dead, he's commanded every man to repent. And you say, well, you know, I think, what about people in Bangladesh? What about people in India? What about people in the Far East? Let me tell you something, beloved. You know, God is a God who loves men. And God will do what he has to to get the gospel to where they are. And if you think you're going to figure out God and how God's working, what about the lost, what about the heathen, what about them? You know what? I say to you, get saved and go out from our church and preach the gospel in the regions beyond. But to sit there and try to figure out, I don't think it's fair. I don't think God's right. I don't think it's, it's uh, you know, very kind of God to, to uh, uh, not tell people about Christ. You mark it down. The Bible tells us the gospel hath appeared to all men. The grace of God hath appeared to all men. Now, whether you understand or not, it doesn't matter. That's what God says. Amen. And so men have more light today than ever before. The unconverted intellectuals are rejecting the Godhead. They're rejecting the Father. Here in verse 29, of how much more sore punishment suppose yet thought worthy who had trodden on the foot the Son of God and counted the blood of his covenant wherewith he was sanctified on the holy thing hath done despite on the spirit of grace. If man loves God, he'll love God's Son also. But it's, it's man's despising God and trodden on the foot the Son of God who's doing the same thing to the Father and the Spirit. He's rejecting the conviction of the Spirit and the gracious call of God, uh, the Father to repentance. And that's the bottom line. Man rejects it. And then second of all, he rejects the Son. To trod under the foot means to trample on, to count as worthless. And I want to tell you something. We just sung a song about the, the, there's a fountain filled with blood. And I experienced that back in 1976. I'll never get over it. I'll never get over it. I received the blood of Christ and took away my sin. And you have the arrogance, the innocence to trample the blood of Christ? Go ahead. Go ahead. See at the judgment seat. And it won't be a pleasant day for you, my friend. The rejection of the Son of God. Count it as worthless. My lost friend, I implore you to consider the gravity of your lost condition and respond to the Lord's calling in your life 
Repent of your unbelief. Repent of pride, your sin, life without God. And third of all, there's rejection of the Spirit. The Bible teaches us that we're born again by the Spirit of God. It's a Spirit that calls us, that convicts us, that converts us. But man is lost condition. His lost state treats the Spirit of God with disdain, with arrogance, contempt, presumption. And although the Spirit will deal with lost men for a, a time, let me stop here and just tell you, there's a window of opportunity. How long? We don't know. We don't know. I've heard people who've been witnessed to, and the following week they, they died. They had a heart attack. They, they got hit by a car, whatever it was. So there's a window of opportunity. If you think God's going to wait around forever, you're not thinking right about God. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So God's a God of love. Yeah. He is, and he loves you and wants you to be saved. But he's also a God of wrath. It's a God of wrath. And though the Spirit will deal with lost man for a time, give him a chance to respond to truth, there will come a time when the Spirit of God will stop speaking to the heart of man. Notice here with verse 30. For we know him that hath said vengeance belong unto me. I will re recompense, save the Lord. I, again, the Lord will uh, judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. So not only will the loss be dealt with, but the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of, of the living God. And remember, it's a living God. He's alive. He's not distant. He'll speak to your heart. You get saved, he'll comfort your soul. He'll give you assurance of your salvation. You don't have to drum it up. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a believer. I'm going to, you know, it's, it's natural once you get saved. It's a no-so salvation. And you may think, oh, I'm saved. I'm, I'm going to trust in God's word. When you're saying stuff like that, I don't believe you're saved. Because you know because the Spirit of God lives within you. It's not trusting John 3.16. It's knowing. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So we see man's rejection, God's retri retribution, verse 31. He says, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. God has given every man a free will. To will choose to believe or reject it, but he's he, uh, but be assured that there are eternal consequences by rejecting the truth. Think with me of the examples that God has given us, us in His Word. Those rejected the truth, and as a result, were were judged by the tr true and living God. There was Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who rose up against Moses, and the ones uh, the the one God who set in authority over the children of Israel and would destroy, he not only destroyed them, he destroyed their families. And remember this, when God's leadership is falsely accused, uh, an attack is uh, really uh, an attack on God. And that's, that's serious. That's serious. I know I'm a man. And I, I'm not going to argue with anyone. I know I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. But when you, when you rise up against divine institution and you raise up against God's man who uh, you know, has fruit in his life, it's dangerous. And those three families, Cor, Dathan, and Byron, were destroyed. Their families, everything they owned was swallowed up in the ground. So where did, where did they go? They went to hell. That's exactly where they went. And then we see Belshazzar. He's a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But he did not know the worship, the, uh, know how to worship the true and living God. His grandfather, uh, King Belshazzar, threw a great, I'm sorry, let me back up. Uh, he's true and living God as his grandfather had. But King Belshazzar, the grandson, threw a great feast for his lords. 
It was, and this was, it was so wicked what they did for three days. They drank themselves. Uh, they were gluttonous. They were immoral. And the king decided then, this is a really brainiac after a three-day binge, he decided, let's get the, the holy uh, vessels from the storage of the Jews. And now they're going to start attacking God. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can attack anything you want, but leave God out of it. You want to badmouth things? That's fine. You want to badmouth our church? That's fine. But leave God out of it. You are, you are heading towards trouble like you've never known before. I'm telling you, people are downright fools. And I know them. I've, I've seen them leave. So we see uh, the intent was to mock the God of the Jews, thus manifesting the arrogance and rebellion and the pervanity of their heart as King Belshaz and his lords were drinking and carrying on out of nowhere, a hand appears. Well, I don't know if that's true. You know, I, okay, that's fine. Believe what you want to believe. I believe every word in the Word of God. Amen. I believe it's exactly the way God said it. And the king was more than a little trouble, uh, and he sought out wise men, soothsayers, astrologers, anyone who could tell him what the writing meant, but no one could interpret it. Then the man of God, Daniel, came in and he read the writing aloud. And Belshazzar was gripped with fear. You know, it's one thing to be scared. Say, oh, you know, I like, you know, scary movies and all that stuff. I, I don't. But anyway, nothing here or there. But to have fear because of God, you don't get over that one. It's there permanently. And the Bible tells us uh, that Daniel came in and read, writing out loud, Belshazzar uh, was there, and the writing was foretelling the imminent ruin of Belshazzar and his kingdom. And that night, Belshazzar and the, the king was destroyed. Why? You don't mock God. He's the one who created those vessels. And in Hebrews 10 and verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And there it was. Belshazzar and the kingdom of Babylon was destroyed that night. In Proverbs 1, verse 28, Then shall they call on me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but not, they shall not find me. Why? Because they had pushed God away. They said, I'm not going to be saved today. I'm not going to come to Christ now. Even though God was speaking their heart and troubling them, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to put it away. Put it away to the place where God said, you, you can call on me. I'm not going to answer. You, you, can, you, you can, you know, seek me early, but you're not going to find me. Whereas once the verse said, if you shall seek me with all your heart, you find me. It's the opposite was true. God said in Ezekiel 8, verse 18, Therefore will I deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not uh, spare, neither will I uh, have pity. And the um, Bible goes on and says that, um, you know, destruction is headed for the people in Ezekiel's day. Number two, it's not only uh, uh, a divine judgment, but it's a dreadful judgment. In Hebrews 10, verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing. It is an equitable or righteous judgment. So why is it righteous? Because God has given you an opportunity to respond to him to come to him. He's graciously 
offered it to all men, all women, all young people. You say, that's not the God I know. Well, it's sad. That's the God of the Bible. You, you know what the problem is? You made up a God in your mind. Say what you want. That's exactly what you've done. You made up a God in your mind who you believe in, but it's not the God of the Bible. And there are many reasons for men to reject Christ. There's temptation. Let's go to Luke chapter 8, please. Luke chapter 8. And notice, if you would, verse 13. The Bible says, and They on the rock are they which, when they hear, and when they hear, receive the word with joy, but they have no root which for a while believe in a time of temptation fall away. So there are temptations that people have that will take their heart away. So you say, but preacher, they receive the truth. That's, that's true, but there was no root in their heart. There was no root in their life. And as a result, it was a false profession. And for a time, there, uh, an attraction to the gospel, salvation, the Christian life, but instead of submitting to the righteousness of God through repentance and faith, they put off the most important decision they will ever make in this life, and after a while they depart. And you know what God says in verse in chapter 6 of Hebrews? They, they're never renewed again to repentance. Never. It's impossible. Let's look at that real quick. Hebrews chapter 6. The Bible says, in verse 4, for it's impossible for those who once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. So the problem is they, these, are, these are terms, not speaking of saved people, but people who were enlightened, they had an understanding. Uh, they, they tasted of the heavenly gift. They, the Spirit of God was dealing with them. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And not saying that the Holy Ghost dwelled in them, but they were conviction and trouble and have tasted the good wor word of God and the power of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them uh, again in repentance. So this is not, you know, willy-nilly, come as you want, and come whatever you want, whatever you want to do. No, 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 no. You're dealing with a, a totally different person, and that's Jehovah God. It's not go shopping when you want, buy this when you want, you know, invest in this when you want. It's if God is dealing with your heart, that's sobering, that's serious, you've got to respond. You must respond. You cannot depart. Second of all, there's a lack of repentance. Let's go back to Luke chapter 14, please. And follow along with me as we look at verse 25. And the Bible tells us, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said to them, Why were they following Jesus? He did miracles. He fed them. Why wouldn't they follow Christ? But Jesus wanted them to know that following him physically is not what's going to save them. they got to consider some things in life. So he goes on and tells them, If any man come to me, hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, ye in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So he's saying it's a love less. In other words, you're going to be close to people, that's fine. You're close to your family, but I want you to be close to me. That's important. A lot of people die and go to hell because they did not put Christ first. God's not going to play second place. He's not. Verse 27, whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Cross-bearing was a known fact in Jesus' day. You're going to die. If you were sent to the cross, you are going to die. There's no way you're going to survive the cross. 
His back was torn open. He had a crown of thorns placed upon his head. He was beaten with a two by four. He had his beard plucked out. And then they, they stuck a spear in his side just to make sure he was dead. So you've got to be willing to bear your cross and come after him. You've got to give him your life, come after Christ. Then he says in verse 28 to 32 about building a house, about going to war against another king. And he tells us you've got, you've got to count the cost. And a lot of people don't count the cost. They just respond to the flesh. That, oh, I want to be saved. You know, I want to get this car. I want to get this thing. I want to get this gadget. I want to do this. That's not the way it is. You've got to count the cost. You've got to wait out. Then he said in verse 33, So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsake not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. You see that? You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot be his disciple if you don't forsake all things. Say, I, well, I'm, I got a special re rapport with God. Okay. God's word doesn't count, but your word does. Let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to stick with God's word. Amen. Not forsaking it all, not willing to complete, go after a light and a let go of your lifestyle, your plans, your relatives, your dreams, your spouse, your job, your friends, etc. Maybe you're hanging on to false religion. They're a little bit mixed between your old church and the Baptist church. Hanging on to a false profession or experience. Not exactly worldly, not exactly converted either. Not living for the devil, but not living for God. Just simple disobedience. That's what it comes down to. And then third of all, there's neglect. Again, Hebrews 2, 3, how shall we escape if we neglect? If you're careless. God's not going to forgive you because you're careless. He's not going to say, you know, this person, this man, John, he was a good man. I'm going to let him in. He, you know, he, did, he was careless, but I'm going to let him in. He made a mistake. It's not working that way. God's a God of righteous judgment. You're right or you're wrong. Do you remember Uzzah? He's the one who grabbed the, the, uh, the ark. <laughs> I couldn't think of it. The Ark of the Covenant. He did a good thing. He didn't want it to fall on the ground. And it would have. But God killed him because he was disobedient. And again, we see that those who put off giving their life to Christ. Uh, will have, will uh, if you have not made uh, your your heart to repent for salvation, then God will stop speaking to you sooner or later. And then it's eternal; it's forever. There's no recourse. It's the final judgment. There's no there is remembrance. Memories are such a joy, a comfort, pleasure, encouragement. But memories can be haunting. Abraham told the rich man in hell, remember that thou in thy lifetime. Third of all, it's a damning judgment. Verse 31, notice the Bible says, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. You have no, no strength, none. You think you're strong? You think, oh, I, I can, no strength. Verse 26, the Bible says there's no sacrifice of sin remains. He said, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. It's Christ and nothing. Jesus died on the cross. And that's what you had to receive is what, what Christ did for you. Those who continue to reject the truth will one day find themselves in a place with there's no forgiveness of sins because they rejected Christ. 
Verse 27, But a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. And it's a greater judgment, a certain fearful judgment. The Bible says that the judgment is damning because of the portion of Christ's rejectors. Let's go back to chapter 16 of Luke, please. Chapter 16 of Luke. If you have questions right now about your salvation, pursue them. Don't brush them off. Don't go have brunch and eat a bagel and just start yucking it up. If you have questions in your soul about your soul, you need to seek some out. Get that settled. Because in such an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Notice if you would, chapter 16, verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. That verse alone, that verse alone just dipped the tip of his finger in water and put it on my tongue. I'm tormented. You think that's going on right now? Down below in the middle of the earth is where hell is. And there's a great gulf fixed. And people like this rich man went to hell. Why? Because he rejected the truth. Verse 25. But Abraham says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things and likewise last with uh, evil things. But now he's comforted and thou art tormented. But beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that day which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us uh, that would come from thence. So you see, uh, in verse 24, the, the feel, the torment. That's what they have in hell. And why? Because they rejected Christ. They said no to Jesus. God dealt with their heart, and they were, they were going to be smug and smarter than God. Right. Verse 24, they cry for mercy. Verse 25, they have memory of this life on earth. Verse 26, there's no escape. There's a great gulf fixed. Commentator Arthur Ping stated, with this unfathomable sorrow, they will recall the opportunities wasted. The warnings of God's servant disregarded. The proclamation of God's gospel spurned. And then to know there's no escape. There's no means of relief. There's no hope to, uh, to uh, reprieve the final portion of the Christ rejecter. First of all, the separation forever. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, they're punished with everlasting destruction from the present Lord. Now, beloved, I've been studying the Bible for 47, 46 years. One thing I fear, and I'm, I'm saying this as a saved man, my sins are forgiven. My sins have been washed away in the blood of Christ. I know that. But the thing I fear is for the lost to die without Christ and uh, have everlasting destruction before them. How long is everlasting? Forever. It's forever. It's forever. It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's not going to end. A constant feeling of falling, falling. Uh, the, the torment the suffering. You're going to have devils down there who take out their wrath from God's wrath upon you. I heard of a dope. I say that sincerely. A dope of a man who said, oh, hell? Yeah, I'm going to hell. And I'm going to open up a barbecue stand down there. The man has no understanding of God's wrath of God's judgment, he's a foolish man, a 
foolish man. There's punishment forever. Hell was designed for the devil and his angels. How intolerable would it be? All Christ's rejectors will be cast in the same eternal fire as the enemies of God to torment eternally. In Luke chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Jude chapter 7, hell is described as the vengeance of eternal fire. God's faithful warning uh, of man of the consequences for rejecting his son. Seven times Christ states there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth denoting the completeness of the rejection, uh, re misery and anguish. And third of all, punishment with, mo with the most vile. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. And the Bible says in verse 8, again, this is God's judgment on, on the most vile, but the fearful and unbelieving. That's the first two. The fearful and the unbelieving. So you don't have to be vile in that, in that sense. And the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. So God's word is truth. And please weigh these words uh, of uh, Solomon uh, implication. Uh, you may pride yourself on good character and good morals and good discipline, but do not self-deceive. If you're not a convert of Christ, you'll surely have your lot in, with all Christ's rejectors. It'll be a company of Cain and Pharaoh, Belshazzar, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, with Judas Iscariot, and all atheists and devil worshippers, agnostics and God haters, and Christ rejectors and blasphemers down through the ages. Number four, punishment of darkness. Jude 13, the Bible says, the blackness of darkness forever. Forever. No relief from suffering, no relief from torments, no escape. No possibility of rest or repeat, reprieve. Uh, no deliverance, no shelter from heat, no water, no light, no cool breeze, no change, punishment forever. No improvement, uh, no uh, lessening of the punishment, no resistance to God's judgment. Ezekiel 22, 14, can thine heart endure? Or thine hands be strong in the day that I shall deal with thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. There's no, there'll be no sinner who can escape or endure this eternal punishment. Jonathan Edwards, the preacher who preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, described it this way. They will wholly sink down eternal death. There will be a sinking heart of which we cannot conceive. There will be great struggle, lamentable groans and panting. And these, are, these are the struggles of screaming of the body to support itself on the extreme pain. And this is the death of the body as, it, as down it sinks. So it will be with the soul in hell. It will have no strength, no power, to deliver itself and his torment and his horror will be no, so vastly disproportionate uh, to his strength, it will utterly and eternally sink without the least degree of comfort of hope. All relief is withholden. All support utterly gone. It sinks in the darkness of eternal death. And we can conceive but little of the matter, but it's to help your conception what you were thrown into the fiery oven, a great burning furnace, 
What if you were to lie there just a quarter of an hour, fully aware and sensible of your pain? What horror would you feel? How long that quarter of an hour would seem to you? But what would the effect on your soul be if you knew you had to lie there for 24 hours or an entire year? What, what if you knew that you must uh, endure for a thousand years? Oh, then how your heart would sink. If you knew you must bear it forever. But your torment in hell will be immeasurably greater than the illustration presents. Utterly inexpressible. Must the torment and the sinking of eternal soul uh, be in such cases? So, I want to ask you, I know you've heard of this many times before, but be honest with yourself. If you died right now, where would you go? Would you go to heaven? And why is that? You got, you got to answer that question. It should be because I repented, I trusted Christ. But if you say I'd go to hell, friend, I have to tell you, you don't want to. You want to be saved while you can. You say, well, I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. I've said I've been saved all these years. I want to say this to you in Christian love. So what? You can hang on to that profession of faith and go to hell? You're going to die without Christ because of pride? I chuck your religion. I chuck your false profession, I'd come to Christ and get that settled immediately. Let's stand on our feet, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and no one looking around. And Father, we ask you today, Lord, that you deal with hearts. I pray you'd give the lost no rest. I pray, Father, they'd come to Christ before it's too late. I pray, Father, that they would have repentance and faith, and regardless of what, uh, who sees and what's going on, they would make a beeline to Christ. And I pray they'd be converted to Jesus. And Father, I pray that there wouldn't be one who dies without Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name.